Radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right. Good evening. How is everybody? Did you miss me? How you doing? Today's Monday, October 16th, 2023. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. That's right. I just, and when I say just, I just got back from Egypt. And uh, our guest tonight is Timothy Hogan. And here's the funny thing. As I was arriving in Egypt, in the airport, Timothy was leaving Egypt. We just missed each other. I was watching their post, and uh, I thought the posts were a mistake. I was like, wait a minute. How can you be there without me? And uh, we we thought we were going to bump into each other. We just missed each other, but tonight we are together here on Fade to Black. All right, so... Lots to talk about tonight. He just got back from Egypt. I just got back from Egypt. Tonight, we're talking about alchemy all night long, and it it, it couldn't be a better or more perfect show. I'm bright-eyed. I am bushy-tailed after a 17-hour direct flight out of Saudi Arabia, (laughs) from Saudi Arabia to Los Angeles. Yes, yeah, 17 and a half hours. That's a long plane flight. Um, and I, I let me tell you something. I slept. Oh, man. After spending 10, 12, what was I in Egypt for 12 days? Uh, that flight back, so much adventure, uh, so much knowledge and everything else. Uh, I am ready to go. Had a busy day today. I knew that I had to deal with all of this today on Monday. Uh, which is why I didn't do the news today. Today I had to go to a car dealer um, and and purchase a car. That's a whole. I I, I repurchased my Jeep. That's what, but I had to do it today. And today was tax day, so I had that to deal with. Everything done. Everything finished. <laughs> it was just like. Man, I just want to relax, and but I've got shows to do this week. So uh, three great shows th- uh, this week. We have the unbelievable Timothy Hogan on tonight. Tomorrow night, we have Daryl Anka. That's right. Bashar is on the show tomorrow night. Wednesday night is Richard Dolan. So this is a action-packed week this week here on Fade to Black. And no show on Thursday. And there's no rest for me. Sleep is for sissies in my life because Thursday morning um, I start a production uh, uh, for another season of Into the Vortex, and that's going to take place this weekend. So, uh, but I'll be back, and then we've got more shows next week. Of course, fade to black. There'll only be three shows next week too, as well, because next Thursday. I have more production to do on the next season of Into the Vortex. So, all busy stuff around here. And as soon as I'm done with that, then I turn around and I head to Vegas uh, for Stairway to the Stars. Our guest tonight, Timothy Hogan, will be speaking and presenting at Stairway to the Stars. The links for everything are below Stairway to the Stars, and there's a discount code and everything else to get tickets. And that's it. We are um, uh, less than a month away, uh, actually three weeks away from Stairway to the Stars in Las Vegas. And then as soon as that wraps... Uh, a day or two later after that, I head to Peru, and I'll be down in Peru uh, for uh, the rest of November. So now you're really going to miss me. Um, so there you go. All right. It, it's been a busy year this year. Um, I am blessed. I am honored 
to not only have the show, but to have all of you hanging out with me. All right. All right. So let's get straight to it. And tonight, Timothy Hogan is here. We're going to be talking about the alchemical terms and techniques, the same ones that the ancient cultures used all over the world and how it is applied today because we inherited all of this stuff, didn't we? So we're going to talk about all of that. He's an author. He's an international lecturer. Of course, he is the past master within several different spiritual and uh, traditions, including many bodies of Freemasonry and Rosicrucian lineages. Uh, lineages. He's also right now the Grand Master for the Order of the Temple of the Secret Initiates, a Knights Templar lineage, and he runs the Templar Collegia in associated uh, with all of that too, as well, his knowledge in all of the alchemical ways and Masonic rituals, everything is Timothy Hogan's world. So we're going to get into all of that tonight. Uh, all his websites are uh, posted below and over on social media. Enough of the big intro. Let's just get straight to it and say good evening to the one and only Timothy Hogan. I call him Tim. Yeah, good to see you, Jimmy. <laughs> it's good to see you, man. Hey, do you remember? Um, welcome back from Egypt, by the way. Thank you. And, you too. <laughs> man, I got to tell you, it was pretty strange. I got there on uh, the second or the third. It's all a blur to me now. Uh, but on the seventh, war breaks out in Israel, just a hundred miles to the north of us uh, from Cairo. And very strange feeling to know that just like right there, you can almost see it, man. It's just, it's right there. And I, I don't like war. I, I, don't, I don't like uh, any, any, anything to do with it. And to know that that was happening so close to us was just a very strange feeling. And, and security is already tight in, in Egypt. Uh, tourism is, is uh, their economy. So, you know, the, the tourists and, and, and that machine, it's all protected and you could feel you're secure. You feel safe there. It, it's great. But it, it went up a notch there, Tim. <laughs> it went up a notch. I'm telling you right now. Yeah, it, was, you know, it was a weird vibe. I, you know, I was just there in Israel uh, about a week before I was in Egypt. So only two weeks ago. And, uh, you know, it's weird to think that it was just the calm before the storm. And uh, I'm glad that we were able to get out of there. And uh, I'm certainly feeling for the all the people who can't get out of there right now. I mean, it's a it's a tough it's a tough situation. Yeah, it's um, and I, I was talking to, um, uh, you know, it's 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 what everybody was talking about there. Not only you know our group, but everybody uh, was talking about this. Yeah. And one of the things that was repeated um, uh, to me, which I found very interesting. And okay, I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit and kind of simplify it, but that the rest of the world and the rest of the world's media does not understand how old these relationships are between the cultures. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, this is we want to we want to make it something modern, you know, like it's some modern political thing that's going down right now. We're talking right. about thousands and thousands of thousands and thousands of years of of relationships and 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 how they uh, deal with each other and not, yeah. not to get deep into uh, that side of it and and the geopolitics of it all, but uh, and, the, and the religious aspects of it, but we don't have that concept. This isn't something you just throw a bandaid on and fix. Um, it, it's it's you know it's five ten thousand years old. Yeah, and and uh, there's some very ingrained uh, conditioning on on both sides of that conflict, you know, and uh, and some of that has come from uh, the the bad conflicts that happened in the past. And so, you know, people don't forget that. And it, it sure makes it hard to move forward. 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I mean, I like everybody else. Uh, I mean, pretty much everybody else. We've just got to figure out. And this was also the the word on the street in Egypt from people that I was talking to. We've got to figure out a way to just stop. You know, and, and this is they don't they don't like this any more than anybody else does. Um, it sucks. And they, they I, I it's it, it's time. I don't know how. You know, maybe it's just, you know, you're a kid and, you know, you're playing Cowboys and Indians or whatever in the backyard and you're like, truce. Well, maybe that's, you know what I mean? Okay, that's it. That's it. It's over. It's done. Truce, truce, truce. Let's all tap out and call uncle, you know, and maybe maybe that's it. Maybe it could be that simple. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, uh, unfortunately, it might have to get even worse before people get to that point, it seems like, which is sad. I mean, it's just sad. <laughs> you know, um, and, and speaking of that, um, you just got back from Egypt. I just got back from Egypt. And yeah. there is uh, one thing uh, that is there. And it's, uh, and I'm just talking about on the walls and, and part of the story and, and stuff. Um, where the, how do I say this? I don't, I don't want to say this the wrong way. There is, um, there's a certain amount of control that you have with, you know, and all of the Pharaohs went through this. They wanted to be the greatest warrior, the greatest, you know, Pharaoh general. They wanted them, uh, so they wanted themselves represented in strength. Mm -hmm. And, and a lot of it was BS, right? Those, <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, them going to war and fighting these great battles when they never fired an arrow, right? Mm -hmm. But they're slaying dragons. Um, but that's how you, uh, uh, you know, bring everybody together, and and they think it's a way to gain respect. And in some in some ways, I understand that, but it it it, it does become ingrained in the culture where the, uh, the, that projects strength for the country, and it scares the crap out of your enemies or anybody that would think about crossing your borders. You mm -hmm. know, and it's it, it's everywhere in the walls and temples in Egypt, isn't it? Yeah, well, not only that, but they would, you know, it, it seems to be that the pharaohs uh, and some of the dynastic Egyptians, they would actually just carve their names on monuments that they didn't even create. <laughs> you know, they, in fact, we know Ramses the Great, for example, he, he went in and and completely put his name over, he, he scrubbed out other people's names and put his name on there. But the reality is those people he scrubbed out uh, may have just uh, put their names on the monuments too, and they may not have had anything to do with building them. So it's a, it's a complicated <laughs> PR process. Yeah. And it's also cheaper to do it that way too. Instead of yeah. build a, build a new temple, just, uh, you know, deface it and, and put you or yourself up there. And you see that repeated a lot. Um, now let's, let's kind of start here for a second. Um, I want to talk about alchemy tonight mm -hmm. and I, I went to a, a few special places. Some of them we'll, we'll discuss tonight. And you and I were talking about them uh, right before the show, um, is that we have, let's say the, the word chem, mm -hmm. right? So we have alchemy, we have chemistry, we have chemit. Right. And and now spelled differently, yeah, but it's the pronunciation uh, that is the same. And those foundations all go back to Egypt. Everything, you know, gets pushed back into Egypt. Is it a mistake to think that, you know, the, the word chemistry that we use today, right, and the mad chemist uh, with beakers and stuff, uh, backs up into alchemy, which backs up to Egypt, which... Uh, the name Kemet means a few different things, but the word Kem is right there. And, yep. and I, I see and feel the connection. Am, am I wrong? No, there's definitely a connection there. And in fact, the alchemists, if you read any of the alchemy texts of the 
uh, 1500s and 1600s, people like uh, Michael Meyer, Robert Flood, um, Thomas Vaughn, other people, Eugenius Philolathes, they, they all said that the alchemical uh, science came from Egypt. So they, they said it in their own writings that it all came from Egypt. And uh, it's true that a lot of the, even the chemicals that are found within, uh, chem within chemistry, but previously were found within alchemy, uh, they even have names that, that harken back to Egypt. I, I'm, I'm thinking of like uh, ammonia, for example. The word ammonia has the root in it of amun, which was Amun Ra. And what would happen is they would start to collect the ammonia from where the animals were being kept outside the temples. And that's out, out, outside the temples for Amun Ra. So that's literally where they got the name for it. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an ancient science going back to Egypt and in the word chem itself or chemit, uh, just meant black and it was or sometimes it's interpreted as black land and they're not talking about uh the skin color of people living there what they're talking about is the the darkness in the nile and the the black soot that would wash up on in the nile that could be collected and be be used to not only fertilize things but but from it you could extract uh, different medicines, you could extract uh, different substances uh, that could be used for all, all kinds of things. And this is really the foundation of what was to become chemistry later on. The, uh, the ideas of mixing something together to create something, um, I, don't, I don't equate that with Stone Age Man. Does it make sense? <laughs> yeah. It doesn't make yeah. sense, right? Yeah. It, it, um, it, it, the these ideas are traditions uh, that have been handed down for millennia, yeah. uh, way before dynastic Egypt kicked off in yeah. in three thousand BC. For sure. Where yeah, exactly? <laughs> um, where who who did the teaching? Who brought it? Who brought it to early Kemet? Well, you know the. Plato would say it was the Atlanteans. Um, and uh, you have to remember, too, even philosophers like Aristotle uh, were looking at alchemy and trying to understand it and had uh, were teaching on it to people like Alexander the Great. And they were, they, it was of their own opinion that it had, it was a science that had been inherited from Atlantis or at least some pre-Diluvian civilization that existed prior to Egypt. And the, the secrets to it had been passed down in the priesthoods. And uh, th there were aspects of the alchemical science that involved uh, ex making extractions from certain plants in the region that uh, can be used to... Um, you can you can extract a a um, hydrofluoric acid, which in itself can be used to cut stone, and carve stone, and melt stone, and etch stone, and I'm quite confident this is one of the things that the Egyptians were doing, and the people before them uh, as they were making these giant megalithic monuments. Now, can can we stay right there? Let's let's yeah. stay right there for a second. Yeah. Um, when uh, I always think of this, there is a Stella at the Met in New York, and now the Met and their Egyptian wing, which is like half of the Met, which is already frigging ginormous, is like one of the biggest museums in the world. And and beautiful, and it's got all the stuff. But like half of the museum is Egyptian, yeah. And they even have a temple from Dendara there in the back that yeah. they brought over on boats in the in like 1900, 
think the Wrigley's did it or somebody, the Vanderbilt's, so, you know, some rich family. Anyway, you know, they stole it, you know, from the middle of the desert and reassembled it there. It's pretty incredible. Anyway, you walk through and there's a, they have this Stella, you know, and it's red granite. And on this Stella is, uh, and I, I was just talking to Mohammed Ibrahim about this, uh, by the way, too, as well. We got a really good laugh out of this. On this Stella, it's, it's tens of thousands of hieroglyphs, right? Mm-hmm. Really, uh, you know, like this tall, but they're cut really deep and are like hairlines, mm-hmm. right? They're deep, but they're very thin. And you look, and it's the most beautiful thing you can lay your eyes on because it's perfect and it's just so intricate and so detailed. And and the hieroglyphs are deep, like you can't see the bottom of them, right? They're like deeply cut, but they're hairline, right? Yeah. Anyway, so you get to the bottom of the Stella, you know, you're looking at it, and it's just stunning. There's a little card down at the bottom, and it says, this Stella made of pink granite was carved with this copper needle. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> right. They, they got this copper yeah. needle. It's a needle, just like a sewing needle. Yeah. Copper needle. And that's sitting there. And you're looking at the hieroglyphs and you look at this copper needle. And you're like, no, no it way. wasn't. No, no, way. no, no, no. That 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 didn't make that. No, right. I mean I, that that rose grin, the, the hardness of it, there's no way uh, copper, copper's not even hard enough to t- to make a, a scratch in in no, those no granite. you sharpen the copper right with the with the with the right. rose granite that's exactly. it's the exact opposite but they could do it i suppose if they had an alchemical process or yeah. something to soften that yeah. and then maybe get in there and maybe turn it into maybe putty or you know like oh, a yeah. soft clay yeah i mean that's yeah. possible but but no, they they didn't. How do how do you how how do you suppose those kinds of hieroglyphs uh, were carved with such precision? Well, with uh, everything in Egypt, uh, you know, it's it's hard to determine the age of a lot of it um, because, uh, as is the case with most archaeology. You had earlier civilizations who created things, and then later civilizations came in and and uh, inhabited these earlier sites, and then they started adding their own stuff to what they found. And usually, what happens is the archaeologists will will then point the time frame of its creation to uh, when one of the later civilizations moved in and inhabited it, rather than uh, the consideration that they could be much, much older. But the problem with that is, is that the older, in, in most every case, the older things tend to be more advanced technologically than the newer things. And you see this not only with the construction uh, of the buildings themselves and the, and the temples and, uh, and, uh, and how the stones were cut and laid and the size of the stones. Uh, but um, then there's a, we see certain drilling in some of these stones and certain carving in some of these stones, which uh, are, are very clearly there's high technology being used in it. And um, so we know that the dynastic Egyptians did not have that technology. So we need to ask, okay, well, well, who did? And, uh, what, you know, clearly the Egyptians recognize the significance of these things because they tried to preserve them. They, they even set up, uh, they made attempts at, um, you know, in, in some instances, like some very ancient sites like at uh, the Serapium, for example, they, they created a whole series of mud, mud bricks to try to preserve that site. And then they turned it into a holy site where people would go down and start to eat the dirt and stuff because they thought they thought it was sacred and they didn't understand it. They just knew that a technology had been involved in the creation of, of things that uh, was was far beyond what they were capable of at that time. And in some instances, we could even say it's far beyond what we're capable of even today. 
so I went down. Um, uh, I, I okay. Let's talk about the Asarium for a second because um, uh, we had we were the first people to finally get down there after many, 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 mm-hmm. many years of restoration. And you just got back from Egypt, but you were you didn't go you, you didn't get the when you go back you'll be able to to go down inside of it that is uh tim i'm i'm, I'm just going to tell you that is the most insane thing i have i have ever seen and th- that goes on top of all of the insanity that you see in egypt right yeah right. so um we've all seen the asarian from the top i've i've seen plenty of videos and you know people shooting those blocks and trying to guess and and you know the size and the weight it's a whole nother thing to go down inside of it like I was able to do. And I went into a couple of rooms down there that have been entered in decades, by the way, decades. And it smelled like it too, by the way, um, <laughs> very, very dense, thick, moldy, uh, mm. uh, you know, old smell. Anyway, down, down in the Asarian, uh, going to where the, the flood tube is on the other side, Okay, so walking there, there's an enter. There's a, and it had polygonal interlocking blocks. You don't see it from up top. Can't see it. I'm down there because they're so finely cut. You can't see the grooves from up top. It, you, you can't. So I shot probably 30, 40 images of this, and I'll share them with you later after the show. By the way, everybody, I just got off the plane. I haven't downloaded pictures. Don't ask me for pictures. Don't ask me for video. I have barely got my head together uh, for the show tonight. Um, anyway, looking at it, it, it it's, like, uh, it's, it's like Cusco. It's like socks and Wallman, right? Mm-hmm. It's like that, where they're interlocked, oddly shaped, weirdly cut, don't, don't make any sense, except we're talking about 50-ton blocks. 50-ton, 50, yeah. 50 oddly cut and placed, weird, the, you know, the corners, right? The the fabulous corners that you have um, uh, in, in megalithic structure where the blocks are cut into a corner, interlocking with another block above it. And it's right there in, in the Asarian, to me, I could be wrong, but I think it's tens of thousands of years old. I don't think it's a, it's a modern, it's a modern construction. What do you make of the Asarian and, and its construction? What do you think it was built for? And, and honestly, nobody knows. Well, I, I definitely think it's, well, we know it's some of the older architecture, um, some of the oldest architecture in, in Egypt, for that matter. But um, it's also some of the most advanced, as, as you pointed out, which, you know, is a real problem if you're a regular archaeologist trying to interpret that. Uh, I tend to believe that that area where the Osirian is, is it was some sort of a manufacturing plant. Uh, I think that they were... Um, my my personal feeling is is if you if you also pay attention to what's going on um, at Abydos, which is the temple right above it, uh, they, it's very clear that they were manufacturing uh, what the Bible refers to as mana, or um, what modern science would refer to as monoatomic elements. I think they were extracting it out of the um, the waters of the of the Nile there that you know that was coming in there, and uh, they were they were just extracting things out of the soil there uh, at the Osirian, and then bringing it up later into Abydos and refining them and uh, creating medicines and uh, other. Um, you know, other substances <laughs> that could be used in different ways out of it. I, I think it was a chemical manufacturing plant, essentially. That's that's my yeah, that's exact that's exactly what it looks like. And yeah. I I think that the reasons for the it, its construction is um it looks like okay, so you've got a huge 
uh, when I say huge, it's probably 30 feet tall. It's a round, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, what's the word I want to use? What, uh, what do you call and, it? Uh, a, a tube. Uh, what do you call it? A, a, a drainage. Uh, yeah, drainage cylinder or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't think of the, I can't think of the word right now. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so the water floods in from there. You can see on one side of the uh, uh, Asarian, there's like eight doors that don't make any sense. And they're ginormous, by the way. They're yeah. just huge. And in the middle, you have these. They're about 15 feet tall, maybe 10 feet wide, maybe bigger uh, uh, granite blocks that are just mind-blowingly big. I mean, like, they, they don't make any sense. They're so big. And there's ten, there's five in a row, and then across there's a, a flood channel in the middle. Then there's another five behind you. The reason for that, and you and you look and you see the the tube here, the water flooding it, they they need to be stationary. They need to withstand great, great amounts of pressure that mm -hmm. it is flooding in. Those doors are there for a reason. They're not rooms. Right, it's like flood control, yep. and and you can see that it's some kind of hydroelectric processing, chemical processing plant. You can see that's exactly what it looks like. It doesn't doesn't make it, and and there isn't there isn't any documentation. There isn't anything around uh, stating uh, how it was built or why it was built. But yeah. the the hydroelectric, you know, manufacturing side of it, that's the vibe that you get that you would see in any plant like this around the world today. Yeah, that's right. And and, and the reason why, you know, I think that there's that's probably what was going on there is, you know, up at Abydos, which is just right up above it, even though it doesn't say how it was built or anything like that it does have carved on the walls uh, the processes for extracting uh, uh, monoatomic elements or, or mana and, and other substances. And, and there, there are even rooms at Abydos that are close to the public that um, have uh, on the walls de depictions of a number of things, but, uh, but part of what's also depicted is... Uh, what appears to be vessels, alchemical vessels, and uh, there are, are benches that seem to be set up for uh, doing experimentations and extraction, and the hieroglyphs on the walls seem to be suggesting this is what's going on there. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's I think that's one of the mysteries of what, what's happening there. Yeah, you can see it. It's recipes. Yeah. It's recipes. It's recipes. You can see it. You, it, it. It is. It is clear. These are. It's like a, a laboratory setting. Yeah. Um. And and it's 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 everywhere there. Uh, the recipes are there on the wall. How you interpret them and how you read them, you know. Uh, some uh, Egyptologists read it one way. Some read it another. But clearly, you can see. Uh, it's a factory setting. Yeah, you can see it on the walls. But yeah. um, uh, the Asarian, staying on this for a second, mm -hmm. is is so bleeping big. I want to I want to use some very colorful language here. But when <laughs> you see it from the top, you understand its its size, right? Its width and its depth. It is absolutely huge, but it's deep underground. Because you turn around, they want to say it's Seti the first because Abydos is right there, and and said this is a Seti the first uh, situation. And you look, you're looking down. You, you know, you come out of the back of Abydos, right? Yeah. You're just walking out of the back of the temple, and you walk down into the Asarian, and you can see layers like and layers and layers. Yeah, yeah, it's in a pit. It's in a pit. It's in, it's, a, it's a manufacturing plant, but. Yeah. It's deep underground, and it does that. Whoever built that built that 
tens of thousands of years before Abydos was slapped up on top. Yeah, that's um, right. That, and it, it's the only way to explain that much sediment. And I'm going to say, in some cases, it's 50 or 100 feet thick. And you can see it. Yeah. It's right there. Yeah. Yeah, you, you would, it's, you know, if, if that was above ground at the time it was built, or at least close to being above ground at the time when it was built, then that, yeah, definitely would have put it, you know, several, probably 10,000 years back for sure. Yeah, for sure, it, does, it just doesn't it, make sense. Any... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, go it's, ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't... Over... No, no, it's okay. It reminds me a little bit of the Sphinx. You know, you have the Sphinx and it's kind of sitting in its its little area and then it, it has these giant walls up on the sides of it surrounding it and it's so it's almost like kind of the sphinx itself is almost sitting in a in a pit uh because of you know all the other uh stuff that's around it that it was uh uh that kind of has has protected it to a certain degree in the same way abido sits down in this kind of pit you know where it's surrounded by debris and such but it's it's i don't think that the pit was carved during the time of seti i think it was that that uh those stones were, were put there uh you know long long ago i mean yeah ten thousand years i would say at a minimum be my now, guess uh, now so talking about um alchemy when you mm -hmm. look at stones of that size, okay, yeah. and believe me, everybody, just, just listen to what I'm saying. When we're talking about the relieving stones above the king's chamber, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Over at the Great Pyramid, yes, okay, those, those are big. At the Asarian, we are taking things to another level of ridiculousness. They are huge. And mm -hmm. I have no idea. That's that's where everything boggles the mind. It's it's big and uh, the the size and the weights of some of these things. And then you go to the Asarian, and you're taking it to another level of of geometric perfection. They're gorgeous. They're perfect, but they were moved there. <laughs> that's yeah. Right. And he's just like. And, and Abydos is in the middle. At least the Great Pyramid is off of the Nile. And and you can kind of make excuses for things. All right? Okay, all right. Not Abydos. Abydos is in the middle of it, 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 seriously nowhere. You you drive for hours to get there. And yeah. uh, and the, and there these stones are in the, in, in this pit that are perfectly cut and they're ginormous. How did they get there? Now, if we're talking alchemy, we're talking about Merlin strength magic here. Yeah. How, sure. how did, how did, how did they get there? Well, in, in my opinion, and this is just a opinion. I mean, most of those stones came out of As the Aswang, uh, quarry, which, uh, is, not easy to move you'd have to you'd have most people think oh well they just carved them out of the the quarry and then they brought them downhill to the nile and they put them on boats and then sailed them up the nile and took it to where it needed to go well it's not that simple you have to actually go over a mountain range between uh the aswan quarry and uh the nile and uh just to be able to even get it up that before you bring it back down is is a near impossibility and then to even be able to load it onto boats at that point would have been a whole nother challenge especially some of those giant giant stones so uh there there is a theory that if they you know they were extracting these monoatomic elements out of the nile and these monoatomic elements, when they are subjected to a weak electrostatic or electromagnetic field, it causes the container that holds them to lose weight or to it starts to exhibit anti-gravity effects. And so there is a theory that maybe somehow they were utilizing this uh, in the movement and the erection of these stones. Um, 
not and not just these stones, but also like the the obelisks uh, that we find at at, um, at Karnak and at Luxor, uh, which were super gigantic, uh, weighing uh, hundreds of tons, and uh, you know we are hard pressed to even move those today. So we have to think outside the box a little bit about how they did it in antiquity with so-called primitive technology. And I think the, the real answer is that there, there was not primitive technology that was used. It was actually sophisticated developed technology that probably did come from this ancient civilization that was able to do things that the, later dynastic Egyptians were just not able to do. Yeah, I've, got, I've, got, I've got some uh, pictures here of, okay, I'm going to post this right here. Okay, so let me, it, it'll take me a minute, um, of what we're talking about here and the the idea of moving stuff out of Aswan where where people will mention um things like dude they just they just rolled it on on logs they didn't have trees <laughs> right. they didn't have trees there were no trees and that's the first thing um let's see i'll just call this oz um they didn't have trees and the the cedar the wood that they did have was from israel it had to come from lebanon and that was six, seven, eight hundred miles away up the Nile. So bringing down precious cedar, precious wood, and and rolling one of these blocks, and you have no idea how big these are, man. They are just ginormous. And just ruining a piece of wood uh, for a couple of feet, because that stuff would disintegrate. Yeah. These are not... These are not uh, simple blocks. Okay, let me, uh, I'm going to pull this up. And just so everybody can cop a vibe. All right, just just cop a vibe on this. All right. Let me open this up. I'm going to pull this over here. And there's that. And, and let me do this. Just stay with me. I, I didn't think I was going to do this tonight, everybody, but I am going to do this because I love all of you. Okay, here's this. Okay, let's do this. And the blocks that I'm about to show you um, have a, a size... Okay, th this is, first off, here is the Asarian itself. And now, this has been closed off. Okay, everybody can see my mouse. Okay, this is the tube that I am talking about. That's where the water came in. This goes back and then back underneath uh, the desert back here. The flood waters would come in and go through here. This is where the stone... These are where, if you can look right here, you can see. Look, see this block? Look, look at this block, Tim. Yeah. Look at that cut. Look at that yeah, cut. Yeah, yeah and that's it, right. Yeah, and it goes all, all of these in the corners, right? And it goes underneath here. Look, look at this odd. All of these are cut. See these? Right? And you go it, down. They, they can be it, locked in place. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Now. These blocks here, these are what I'm talking about. That block at its 10 feet wide and at least 15 feet tall. Okay, so see the size of this guy standing right here? Okay, so he would be right here. He's six foot tall. So that gives you an idea of the height and the width. Now, those are duplicated one, two, three, four, five times. There's five more here. And then look what's sitting right on top. More. Okay? And, and this is all roofed in. 
There's one of the roof blocks right here going back in the other direction. There's like three of them here. So these were going down and then covered and then recovered, and this was all sealed in. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, check out this next image. Let me pull this up right here. Boom. Uh, just give me a second. I'm going to pull up this next image just to give you guys a vibe. That's how big those blocks are. Yeah. Giant. <laughs> Giant. Yeah. And and they're just like perfect, 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 perfect. And like I said, this is about 10 feet across, and this is about... 15, maybe 18 feet long. Hmm. I have no idea how to calculate weight of granite. By the way, this is granite. Um, uh, and to uh, to suggest anything else that this is just, and they don't know the purpose of this machine. Yeah, you know, the, the other thing that makes me associate it potentially with alchemical processes is the the, the name itself, Osirian, is, is, of course, named after the god Osiris. And in the story of the god of Osiris, you know, the story goes that that uh, he, he was painted green and because uh, he was like the vegetation god. And his evil brother set tricked him and chopped him up into pieces. And then he was thrown into the Nile and uh, where he drifted in the, in the waters of the Nile for a while until his wife slash sister Isis got a hold of him, uh, his, his parts of his body, and then reassembled him in a new form. Uh, and brought him back to life, resurrected him back to life. He he had uh, went in and uh, you know she did cert certain incantations and um, you know burned incense and oil lamps and the whole bit, and then she raised him back to life. Well, you know this is a pretty general resurrection myth uh, story from which almost all the other resurrection myths in the, in the world come from. But the thing that is significant about it is if we, if we go back to the beginning and remember that Osiris, when he was painted green, he represented the vegetation god. And so if we understand him as representing vegetation, then by chopping him up, throwing him in a solution or a water, in, in the story it's the Nile, but it could just as easily be a, a vessel with liquid in it that would help to digest the uh, the green you know material the 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 plant material uh, and then uh, Isis turns herself into a bird you know a bird flies around in the air uh, in the same way birds in alchemical traditions usually related to distillation where you took that substance that was being digested and you distilled it into a you heated it up and turned it into a steam, and then that steam condensed into a new, uh, a new liquid. Or and, and then from there, you could, uh, in fact, then take it to this next level where you then uh, you extracted other things out of it, and ultimately, all the things that you extracted from this process, you recombined and put back together, and you raised it to a new, a new form, which was a, a new medicine or a new uh, you know, some sort of a new substance. I mean, this was the alchemical process. And uh, so the fact that this structure is known as the Osirian and uh, is named after Osiris himself seems to be alluding to the fact that, hey, okay, this is, this is where the, the, these chemical operations were taking place. You can see here, um, Tim. Let's let's. I want everybody to look at this again. Um, the there are these 
these uh, uh, door it, it, it's not a doorway it's it's like a flood gate right mm -hmm. so there's one here there's one on the other side you can see one here there's like eight on this wall you can see the entrance uh to another one here those are here they don't make any sense except for the there's a chamber back there with these uh uh you know, that's, it looks like it was flooded and released, flooded and released. Yep. It was some kind of process that was going on. The water here, there's, those are, there are 30 steps that go down into this. This is permanently flooded. And uh, there's one in the center here. And there's one on the other side. And you have these two center sections here with the, with the giant blocks on it. And, and then you have this, floodgate here on on the end obviously uh the water poured through these are interlocking blocks came flooding into here this filled up and drained right mm -hmm. they were there's a process of everything going on and which explains to me when you see it and you when you stand in the middle uh as i did i stood right in this door i call it a doorway it's it's the the an entrance to this where the water entered. You stand right here, and I'm just as tall as this railing. This railing like comes up to my neck. And that's right here. That's how big this is. And it all makes sense. It's all symmetrical. The water came in here uh through the center and everything filled up. But that's 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 the that's the purpose of this. I just mm -hmm. I, I don't understand extracting and filtering and 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 putting water through processes uh, yep. is exactly what it's for, right? And and that would be the way to collect the black soot too. That was um, you know that Egypt and and even alchemy was named after was the blackness, you know, and it was it was if you co could collect that black soot, you could extract out of it everything that you needed to uh, create fertilizers that would help irrigate the crops to uh, to create medicines to create acids that could be used to carve uh, the, uh, the the granite stone because the the silica uh, in the granite would melt with the hydrofluoric acid uh, and it, it's all there you could process everything with pretty much the same processes that are outlined in the Osiris myth, and then uh, just applying it to the different substances to extract stuff. Now, and so I was, uh, Tim and I were talking earlier uh, about its depth. So you can see the stairs going down uh, to the top level right here. These stairs, you can't see this, but they wrap around, they wrap around a second time, and they come up to where I am standing right here. Remember, I'm looking down onto these stairs. Now, if you look over on the far side, you can see the years of sediment that have built up, built up, built up, built up, built up. This is the top of the Sahara right here. This is the Sahara Desert. The Sarian is way, way level, 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 way, 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 way deep down. You're mm -hmm. looking down into it. You're not looking at it level and it's built above ground like you would expect. It's deep, deep under the the same uh, the same uh, what's the altitude uh, uh, of Abydos, which is behind you. This is yeah. this is underground. Yeah. Um, and which includes the 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 man, what's the word for that tube? What's the word for it? Uh, yeah. You need to go to Home Depot. You need to buy pipe. It's a pipe. It's a pipe. <laughs> yeah, right. Man, pipe. It's a pipe. It's a ginormous 30-foot tall pipe. Yeah. What's the purpose well, of that? What is and, running through something that big? That's a lot of water. Yeah. And, well, and you can even see, like, uh, towards the top of the stairs or, or at the top of the pipe, you could see those mud bricks, you know, that were were erected probably by the dynastic Egyptians to try to preserve the site. You find that a lot of places, but, but that kind of shows the the difference between the the technology that went into making those giant blocks that are down below, and then these kind of mud bricks that are 
that are yeah, up above. So, you know? so look at it, look at the contrast here that you're referring to in this shot, right? right? Okay. Right. This is crap. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> right. Which, then, which dates to the pre-dynastic or dates to the dynastic Egyptian time, you know, the crap. That, yeah, that absolutely. And then look, look, look at this corner cut. Look at that. Right there. Right, right there. Look at the right. difference between this and this. Right. Yeah. Yeah, they so, were talking okay. about that. I was talking to the director of the site um, that has uh, been doing uh, all of the uh, restoration work. And he was he pointed all of this out to me. You know, he said, yeah. no, this is this is Middle Kingdom work here. You can see it. This is all Middle Kingdom. Right. You know, this stuff here. You know, <laughs> it's just like embarrassing. And then, and then look at this. Right. Yeah. These, it's, these, it's these like corner. Trying to preserve it as best they could, you know, given their abilities at the time. But <laughs> can you imagine? And just like Cusco, right. And sexy woman, right. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at a block like this, which is, you know, I don't know, 12 feet by six. I have no idea how heavy this is, but to cut it so it would fit look, look around yeah. the that's crazy town. Is, and this yeah. block is fitting inside of this notch that is over here. You see it? Yeah, it's almost like a puzzle, a 3D puzzle, like all laid out, just perfect. A hundred percent. Look, like, look at this right here. Look, look at that. Yeah, that, that's just crazy. And and the corners and right. are all. You know, you, you see that in a few places. You see that at the Sphinx Temple, and uh, you see that here, and just a few other places. And in the other place you see it, of course, is uh, in places like Cusco and Sexy Woman, and and. Uh, the other place in the other places in the Americas, you know, so, and part of what makes that type of interlocking stone so significant is it not only does it make it more stable, but it distributes energy through it better. So it's, it's really earthquake proof, you know, it keeps a hundred percent. When you go down into the Asarian, uh, it, you can see, that it's like like it was built yesterday you know mm -hmm. because you look at the rest of the excavations and by the way they're still up top i took some video they got guys up there with wheelbarrows and they've mm -hmm. got the, the 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 well that you know they're pulling up stuff so they're still they're still excavating there's still some serious uh, archaeology going on there um, but the asarian itself when you're when you're down there Man, it don't look old, man. You know it's old. I mean, it's obviously old as the hills, but but it was built to last. And and here we are standing amongst it uh, down below, and it is just beautiful. It's beyond description, man. It, it, it really blew my mind. Uh, we're going to take a break right here, Tim. You're going to be at Stairway to the Stars. Um, by the way, I'm, can, can I do a little bit of disclosure? This is in the interest of transparency to everybody. So I'm putting Stairway to the Stars together, right? And I'm making the phone calls and, and planning stuff. Tim, you were one of the first people that I called. And and you gave me the tell me when I can yeah, right. tell me when and it's coming up now. Uh, I talked to you about this a year ago. A year That's ago, unbelievable, unbelievable. It's yeah. gone by so fast. It's gone by so fast. What are you going to be talking about at Stairway? I'm going to be talking about uh, ancient alchemy techniques from around the world that are similar that are clearly all these ancient cultures inherited it from another civilization. And so what we'll be getting into the proof of that, which will be quite exciting. The, um, okay, let's take our break right here. I just, man, I've got so many things to say on that subject. Uh, you know what? Go to stairway to the stars, go up to Tim, ask me, I'll introduce you to him. Coolest dude in the world. Take your selfie. And, uh, and go, yeah, absolutely. Uh, let, let's take our break right here. Our guest tonight, Tim Hogan. We've got lots to talk about tonight. It is alchemy. I'll be right back after this short break. Stay with us. This is Fade to Black. 
This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Please visit all of our sponsors. We're taking a quick break here. All of the links are below. And we'll be right back. Join us November 10th, 11th, and 12th, 2023. Live at the Luxor Hotel and Casino on the Las Vegas Strip. As Disclosure Fest Foundation and Fade to Black Radio presents Stairway to the Stars, a human origins, science, and technology expo. With live talks, lectures, and workshops by world-acclaimed researchers and authors featuring topics like human origins, ancient technologies, indigenous teachings, workshops, a mass meditation, yoga and sound healing, music, and so much more. This is Jimmy Church, by the way, and I'll be your host all weekend long. Don't miss our intimate sky watch and meteor shower over the infamous Area 51 airspace in Rachel, Nevada, with a special surprise celebrity host guiding us through the night. This event will sell out. For more information and tickets, please visit DisclosureFest.org. Hi, everybody. Jimmy Church here. Very special announcement, and that is we are shipping Fade to Black t-shirts again. It's been almost two years. We did a full upgrade to the website, so you can head over to JimmyChurchRadio.com. It's all simple to do, and it's right there. Remember... We broadcast four nights a week, Monday through Thursday. We bring you the best, the brightest, the most knowledgeable and amazing guests, the best conversations. We do that four nights a week. We also do four days a week. We broadcast the news, and we do that live, too, as well. It's not a one-man show. I do it with website support. I do it with producers. I do it with writers and artists. All contribute to the show. The best way to help support what we do here is with the Fade to Black t-shirt. And you can get your Fade to Black t-shirt one of two ways. First... Go to jimmychurchradio.com, order a shirt. It's really that simple. You're going to get a tracking number, it's going to get shipped, and it's going to get autographed. The second way to get a shirt is with a Game Changer membership. Now, the Game Changer membership not only includes a free t-shirt, but you get a private email to me. You get unlimited commercial free downloads. You have full access to the website, and everything includes includes free shipping and everything is autographed. So help support the show. Get your fade to black t-shirt today. The links are below. You can just go to jimmychurchradio.com and it's right on the website. So there you go. I'm Jimmy Church, fade to black. I'm so excited that I just have one thing to say. Go back Lee Tappy. River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black blend, the Game Changer blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com. All right. Welcome back, Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Looking at that video, uh, you you know, and look at me now, post-Egypt, tanned, rejuvenated. I walked through a couple of stargates and a couple of rejuvenation chambers, and I feel great. And the first thing I did, 17 and a half hours, and then uh, stuck in LA traffic. I, I got to the house, and I'm this on all that I love. I dropped my bags and ran to the kitchen and made River Moon coffee. I, I hadn't had River Moon coffee in, in 12 days, and I haven't stopped drinking it since I got back. It's the best. Mm. I'm serious. First thing I did. And then food was great over in Egypt. It was. I got back at three. I was home at at five. I was home at 5 p.m. I made River Moon coffee and then ordered a pizza. (laughs) Pizza delivered. And I sat down and, and ate pizza and drank coffee. 
uh, and, until I fell asleep. It was it was a glorious time. Uh, River Moon Coffee, the links are below. And uh, head over to the Amazon store, too, as well. The links are below. River Moon Coffee. I like my coffee, Doc. And don't forget to get your T-shirts. The links are below. Help support the show. Our guest tonight, Timothy Hogan. And we're talking about alchemy uh, tonight, all of it. And, and one of the things that uh, I wanted to uh, get into tonight is everybody wants to know, and it's the King's Chamber. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, when when you first enter, I don't have pictures tonight. Uh, I, I don't have anything prepared, but uh, once again, uh, uh, I was first in uh, to the Great Pyramid, and uh, I took some amazing pictures. And I, I, I was asked not to to post some of them, uh, so I, I, I can't. I can't post them all, but I would certainly talk about them. Um, I, I leaked a couple out, um, uh, but we have uh, Tim. You just went through this too as well. Yeah. Uh, you were just there, so. We have absolute free access um, uh, because of Muhammad uh, Ibrahim and his his um, his relationships uh, that go back decades uh, to everybody that runs all of the sites there um, allow us uh, these special access privileges. And one of the things, you know, they just ask, you know, no, no pictures uh, inside of uh, the Great Pyramid because they don't want they don't want everybody going in and laying in in the box right in in the sarcophagus and taking pictures and and being tourists it's a it's a very 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 special place and so out of respect uh uh that that didn't happen um wink wink Okay, so, <laughs> um, but when you when you when you do something like that, that special, um, and like I said, I was first, so I'm all alone, and 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 you 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 do that march up up up, up the stairs, you know, through the tunnel, of course, uh, the shaft, and then enter the uh, the grand gallery which it's called the grand gallery that's not what it is but just for the sake of understanding uh, to everybody so then when you you get up to the top and you make the uh, you you crawl uh, through that last shaft which is uh, tra- you know full of trap doors by the way and and you can see the mechanisms uh, of all of this but when you enter the grand gallery it is perfect. There isn't another way to describe it, is there? It is divine perfection. It's like a and cathedral. It, <laughs> it, 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 it's it's perfect. Yeah. It's it's like it's brand new. Mm. There isn't another way to explain it. It it's construction and the engineering behind it. Uh, defy any explanation, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, and and to think too that that above that that grand gallery uh, is another chamber that's just as long as the grand gallery. That we the only reason why we know that is from uh, you know recent tests that were done, but uh, no one's been in there yet. But the fact that it's just so huge and magnificent and to think that there's another chamber up above it is almost it's almost too much it makes you realize how small you are that you can feel okay so you can feel the power of the room all right mm-hmm. that you can feel it um and i i think that it is generated from uh you know granite is alive it's crystal right and so there is a, it's alive. And then when you have all of that weight above, you know, that is coming to, that is kinetic energy, right? Mm-hmm. And it's all focused on that. You can feel it, man. You, you walk in there and you immediately uh, turn on. There's, mm-hmm. there's not another way to explain it. 
I went up um, uh, to the walls and and I took a moment uh, to myself. I didn't do all the oming and meditate. I left that to everybody else. I was off in my own world. But I, I went up to the walls and uh, uh, I guess the that would be the east wall and just put my hands on it and stood there with my eyes closed and the the silence the um the the power you you, you could just it, it it's all around you and i think it's kinetic I, I think that 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 is what is going on there's so much weight uh mm-hmm. above and around you compressing together that that energy is constant and doesn't stop. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and not only you have that energy, but then you have all the, the static buildup from the desert surrounding it. I mean, uh, uh, you know, they've, they've done experiments where you could literally stand on top of the great pyramid with a, with a glass bottle with a wet rag on it and hold it up and uh, sparks will start shooting off of the bottle because of the, how that energy just builds up and collects in there. So you have that, you have all that pressure going down and then all that energy going up and it's quite a, yeah. And then not to mention, that's not even counting all the, the geometry that went into building the structure, uh, which, which has its own energy. So it's really a profound place. The uh, let's talk about that box for a second. You and I have talked about it before. Yeah, um, I'm not going to call it a sarcophagus, um, but uh, because it doesn't it doesn't look like one. It's not shaped like one. It's it's very bizarre because yeah. when you go up and you 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 know you're going to touch it, so you do that, of course. But but when you look down inside of it, and it's it, it's a confusing moment. It's too narrow. Mm-hmm. It's too long mm-hmm. and it's too narrow for uh, 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 a sarcophagus to fit into unless yeah. unless unless you know the the Pharaoh weighed you know 65 pounds and was this wide right. because it it doesn't dimensionally, it doesn't look like all the other boxes and sarcophagus that are all over Egypt and in the museums. Dimensionally, the proportions are way off, way yeah. off. D- 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 what, 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 what's the true purpose of that box? Uh, well, you know, certainly it's been used throughout history. Uh, initiations have been performed in there using it. But I think originally... Uh, it's it's my opinion it's that uh, the Egyptians had all these arcs, which the Ark of the Covenant is just a an example of. It's it's like one version of these arcs that they had all over Egypt, and it just so happens if you take the outside dimensions of the Ark of the Covenant and the inside dimensions of that particular box, they fit together just perfect and uh on on a previous show of years you know we discussed how uh, i believe that the arcs were these electrostatic capacitors and especially when the mana or these monoatomic elements were put inside of it which is what the bible says was done so if you were to do that if you were to put that right there in that box uh i think it would just do the the natural buildups of static electricity and the in the the energy from all that weight uh it would just cause an immense buildup within the arc of of electricity which would just broadcast out in the region uh now it can be questionable how far it would broadcast i'm i don't i don't know the math like uh, nikola tesla did but I think that's exactly what Nikola Tesla was trying to create with his Wardenclyffe Tower. And uh, I think that pre-dynastic uh, Egyptians or, or uh, the, this Atlanteans or, or whoever it was probably understood this technology and were using that structure to broadcast electricity in the region. 
There is um, uh, something similar at Edfu. So, Mm -hmm. uh, again, I don't have that image, um, everybody, but they just opened up. And I didn't see this the last time I was in Egypt in in Edfu. Um, in the in the back uh, temple, in the back part of the temple, there is a room there that they've just opened. And I went right up. I took pictures of it. Um, it looks like, man, it looks like an ark. And the ark mm-hmm. is, is up on this stand and a, a stand that was made for it. You can see it. And it's got the handles on it and everything. It's a box. And then it looks this i i don't know but when i'm looking at it it looks like there in front of it is another stone uh uh placement with a rectangle hole carved in it and mm-hmm. you can tell that they were picking this up and placing it inside of this opening in front of it this looks mechanical it looks high tech it's done with a purpose, and it doesn't look ceremonial at all. It looks like a machine, um, yeah. and it, it it goes right back to what's going on inside of the king's chamber. In my eyes, especially when you see them back to back, and you kind of scratch your head. Is it the same process? Is that an arc that is at Edfu as well? Yeah, I think they had. Uh, yeah, they had multiple arcs all over Egypt uh, that were placed in the different temples. I think that that's what they used to power the the the, the region around the temple. And it was only uh, later that uh, some of these devices got broken apart or melted down. And uh, now what we have in Egypt is reproductions of what these. Uh, what they think these arcs looked like based on how they're depicted on the temple walls. And Edfu was certainly had one of these, uh, but uh, all I think all of the temples did uh, at one point in time. And I, I also believe that they were probably remnants of this Atlantean technology that the Egyptians inherited. When you go um, at, at Edfu, there is... Uh, the creation um, story that is there um, that I think William Henry originally pointed this out, that this is Plato's uh, conversation about uh, Atlantis that that is there. It goes back 10,000 years. And that was the, the, the those were the founders of Egypt. Uh, that is also at Edfu. And I don't think that that's a coincidence to you. No, I don't. And, uh, you know, you find this too with the artwork all around Egypt. Anytime there's sphinxes, uh, even if they have, uh, even if the sphinxes have the head of a person or the head of a ram or, or the head of a dog, they all have the body of a lion. And they seem to be pointing to this previous age of the lion which uh, would have been leo and that would have been during the time when uh uh, that cataclysm occurred and we would recognize now as the younger dryas uh event that that happened but but it, it seems to be pointing to this time of leo and and not only that but even the crown of osiris which looks like this funny kind of uh, condom looking thing (laughs) that that shape is actually the shape of a lion's arm. And if you go to uh, Muhammad Ibrahim pointed this out to me this last time, if you go to Dendera, the temple of Hathor at Dendera, there, there are sphinxes right at the door of the temple of Hathor and the, the, the arms of the, those lions, uh, arms or the the yeah the the arms of the lion of the sphinx are in the shape of the crown of Osiris himself. So it seems to be pointing. You know the Egyptians were trying to preserve the memory of this time that went back to what would have been the age of Leo, which uh, is is appears to be when this a catac- cataclysm had occurred. 
and it's probably the time where a lot of this stuff was originally built uh and the the later egyptians just kind of inherited it here is the image uh of of this in edfu yeah and now i i I mean i was uh it's funny you can see my shadow here uh taking the picture that's my arm sticking in with my cell phone (laughs) right there um this is crazy to me and when you the idea of what an arc is and how it's been represented uh, over the years, and then you see something like this uh, with this box in the background, and you can see where it was obviously moved. This fits inside of this. Yeah, this is this is pretty incredible, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And and again, you find that. Same type of structure uh, with arcs at all those temples of Egypt, um, and uh, they just happen to have it at Edfu. They've they've created that reconstructed arc there for people to see and to show, you know, that it it would have originally existed in that area. But if you go to any of the other temples, they they have these arcs depicted on the temple walls and. Uh, and they they show them uh, undergoing transportation, and in fact, at at uh, Abydos, there's a that room that I was talking about earlier, where there's all the chemical supplies and everything being depicted. Uh, also has depicted these arcs on the walls, and and it shows them going under transportation and. And there's even uh, Templar graffiti there from the 1100s when they were, when they were studying this and trying to figure out, you know, where these arcs were and uh, how to get a hold of them, how to utilize them, bring them back to Europe to uh, try to bring a new golden age for for Europe at the time, get it out of the Dark Ages. Man, this this blue. I mean, so I'm I'm looking at this. And there's this, uh, uh, you can see this in the front. There's one in the back too as well. And there's this carved piece of stone in the middle that's curved. And then this bust um, here is connected. Yeah, it's horse uh, connected here. And it's the same thing on the back. And there's horse on the back. Um, It's it's beautiful, man. And it's it's big too, by the way. This is not. This is, I don't know how many feet or, or anything, uh, but it's probably uh, uh, 10, 15 feet long. This box in the back of the room is huge. Okay, yeah, probably, it's huge. And that probably weighs 50 tons. That box yeah, it's, 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 it's just ginormous. Yeah. Um, but uh, pr- pretty incredible. And so I walked away from that. And uh, I turned around. I uh, forget who was sending her back at me. I go, that's an arc. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what it is. It, it, it's like Indiana Jones. You're looking yep. at an arc. That's, that's it. Right. That is just mind blowing. Mind blowing. Right. And they have some, they, they created, uh, there, there's three others, uh, reproductions of that that I'm aware of in Egypt. One is, uh, well, two of them are found at the uh, at the entrance to the Karnak Temple. There's a there's a, there's kind of like a little room that you go through at first, which has a model of the entire complex. Yes, and, uh, in that room, they actually have two of those arcs, and then there's also one at Luxor itself on the Avenue of the Sphinxes. And it's if you uh, there's a there's these. Uh, sphinxes thousands of sphinxes that that go between luxor and karnak and uh just a little bit away uh from luxor itself on that avenue of the sphinxes they also have a one of these reproduced arcs that's there for people to to see and take pictures of and to speculate on so yeah yeah the avenue of the sphinxes is one of the craziest and, and there's only like, I don't know how many are left there, probably 50, right? Yeah. 
right. out of a thousand. So how how many homes? Forget about the museums. I'm talking mm-hmm. about homes in the world have one of those in it. Yeah. And I would say a lot, about 900. <laughs> There's yeah. 900. Hey, you want to see my Sphinx? <laughs> because they stole them. They're gone. Right. Yeah, they're yeah, that, gone. That and, avenue is about, you know, a couple miles long. It's a couple and, miles long. And yeah. they're just one after another. Boop, 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 boop. The stands are still there. The Sphinxes themselves are missing. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah they got like 15 at the Met. And yeah. you go to the Met, and, and it's heartbreaking. It's cool to see. All right, okay, you're at a museum, and you, and uh, so they've got uh, they've got like 15 in this room with all these pictures, and they're all proud of it. And I just, yeah. I'm like, Man, give them back. <laughs> yeah. just give, give them back. What are you doing? We don't need to see well, this here. You know what I mean? It's yeah, stolen between it's, the Metropolitan and the London Museum and the. Uh, the yeah, right, and, and then France <laughs> pretty much looted uh, so much in the Louvre. They've looted uh, so much out of Egypt. It's kind un, of uh, unreal. It's, it's, okay. it's sad, you know. <laughs> now, uh, uh, speaking of alchemy, I'm going to talk about uh, Stargates for a second. Um, I was yeah, I posted sure. pictures of this, everybody, and uh, you can go to uh, my Facebook or my Instagram. And uh, and see the images of this. Uh, I uh, I saw I, I was taken to a few different stargates, and uh, for my birthday, it was my birthday, October tenth, on my birthday, I was uh, taken to the Temple of the Seven Gates. Now you've been there too yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't have. Any okay, so what it is, it's a small temple, it's not very big, uh, size of a living room, right? Not very big. Mm-hmm. Um, sitting by itself, just just right there, it's in in Karnak, sitting there by itself. Uh, it's a very deliberate construction, um, and it's called the Temple of the Seventh Seven Gates. And when you walk in to this uh, temple, uh, there's two rooms. There's a front room and a back room. That's it. That's all there is. And both of these rooms are probably, what would you say, 20 feet by 20 feet? Maybe. Yeah, about that that size. Yeah. Yeah, 20, very small uh, compared to everything else in Egypt, right? Which is huge, right? And you've got this small little temple. And Mm -hmm. you walk in, uh, in the front room, uh, when you walk it right there are seven doorways inside of themselves. Blip, 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 blip. The temple of the seven gates. And so, Tim, I got to tell you, when, when I stood uh, there and looked at that, it can't be anything but what you think it is. Those are seven stargates. Yeah. Yeah, they're doorways uh, in succession leading to elsewhere. Uh, and, and you know, you can say, oh, well, you're just reading into it being a stargate. But actually, the words for stargate, Saba, can be found there. Right next to it, and, yeah. <laughs> right next to it, saying it's a stargate. So, um, yeah, and, and those... Those are those are unique places that, uh, for example, the, there are other there are a number of other sites around Egypt that have that are listed as stargates that have uh, some sort of a gate like that. But uh, this is very unique because it, again, it does have seven, and it's the only place I've seen around Egypt that has those seven doors all within each other. It's pretty significant. It is. It is. It's tremendous. It, it, it You just stand there and you, that's all that, that that's what the, it's the temple of the seven gates. Yeah, that's uh, that's the name of it. And, and so when you stand there and you look and the doorways themselves uh, and you can see in the picture that it's, it's quite large. 
um, and they're, the doors are interlocked, uh, the gates, I should say, are interlocked with each other. And then um, where do you, where do you, what's your, what's your speculation here? I want your theory behind this. Um, I, I talked to a few people there. I talked to the director of Karnak, uh, of the temple. I talked to him about this. Of course, I talked to Muhammad uh, as well. Uh, there was a priest that was there, and I was able to speak to him. Um, uh, all kind of varied in their opinions. That all of them said it's a Stargate, but um, it's it's to where. Right. Now, so what, what? What ultimately? What? What's your idea behind this? Is it seven different gates to go to seven different locations? Uh, what, what do you think is going on? Probably, I, I, you know, I, you know, I've tried to determine when I look at these things, I'm trying to determine if it's like the, the priest or whoever would put themselves in like a drug state and would look at that during right times. And, and it would almost be like a screen where you were seeing across time and space to an area. And, and maybe you could you could talk with with beings almost like mm. you and I are talking right now over uh, <laughs> looking at a screen, you know, and and uh, talking. Was it something like that, or was it like uh, th that there there actually used to be technology there, and then the uh, Egyptians, you know, tried to create a repro a reproduction of it in stone. Uh, to commemorate what was once there. That, that's another possibility, too. Um, or, you know, another possibility is it was just a designated place and that there were beings from the stars who were able to to use that as, a, as the spot that they came out of. I, mean, I, I can say uh, one of the places that I've, I've had access to in Egypt, which is close to the public, is the, the sanctum area of, of Hatshepsut's temple, funerary temple. And at, at the top level, it's, it's kind of a, there's three levels to the funerary temple. And on the top level in the middle, there is this, uh, there's the sanctum area. And it is also listed as a stargate, but they have guards posted there 24 um, seven, not letting people in there. You can, you can come up close to it and take a photo, but from the vantage point of where they let you come up to, you can't see what's actually on the sides of the walls in the room. Uh, if you go into the room, though, uh, I can tell you what's depicted on the walls are uh, what almost looks like a like an oval with stars in it. And then you see gods coming out through the oval, just like just like that movie Stargate. And and meeting with Hatshepsut and giving her instruction. So that, that's what's being depicted on the walls that's so controversial that the Egyptian government keeps it closed off 24-7 and lets no one in there. Um, so it suggests that uh, whatever these Stargate gates were, is they were... Um, they were they were places where the gods or at least uh, superior beings uh, were able to come through them somehow, whether it was actually physical or whether it was just a uh, recording like a uh, digital recording like we're witnessing right now. But but somehow communication was was taking place between them. And the suggestion is that it came from somewhere else in the heavens. Probably, you know, the, the star systems that the Egyptians point, pointed to all the time were um, Orion, uh, uh, the Pleiades, uh, Sirius, Aldebaran. Uh, there were certain fixed star systems that the Egyptians um, highlighted again and again and again. And they pointed their, their windows towards, the, they included them in their mythology. And I would have to believe that if there were beings that were communicating from another star system, that it would have been one of those star systems that that the Egyptians were highlighting. 
And by the way, you also find this even in the temples themselves, like uh, if you go to Abydos or Dendera or, or um, you know, any of these, any of the Edfu, any of these temples, if you look at the columns, there's actually a hieroglyph on all of the columns at all of these temples that says received from the stars. That's the message that gets repeated again and again and again, received from the stars, which almost implies that there were beings that came from the stars who helped to build this, this, these temples or who had a part in uh, determine, you know, uh, letting them know how to build the dimensions or what materials to use or, or something they had there was some sort of a influence beyond just astrological and and in the temple of the seven gates when you go in the second room the wall behind the wall with the gates on it is a giant tree of life yes and and i find that significant and it's a beautiful one too they have there's a lot uh, throughout egypt yeah this one is uh, is beyond exceptional yeah. it's it's just crazy um but right in the middle are seven onks and they mm -hmm. th this is this okay, okay now look i'm not a genius and I don't read ancient Egyptian. I don't read hieroglyphs. I don't. I can fake it. I fake it on TV really well. But it looks to me, okay, I'm just saying this out loud. Looks like a set of keys. Mm -hmm. That's what it reminded me of. It's like a set of, the, like, those are the keys to the individual gates. Yeah. What What's what's the purpose of those seven onks uh, sitting there clustered together? On the trunk at the base of the tree of life, in yeah. that temple, and again, it's seven of them, and 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 that's not coincidence. Um, yeah, it's almost, so it's almost uh, like the tree is like a cosmic map, and those those onks are the keys to open the different gates to travel along that cosmic map. I mean, at least that's how I might interpret it. Yeah, very, very, very bizarre, very special. That that temple, mm, mm, mm. and if you ever get a chance to go to Egypt, you've you've got to wiggle your way into that. That's 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 something that the 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 Temple of the Seven Gates, that's not listed in the tourist guides. <laughs> that's right. just not there. That that that's a very 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 special very sacred place. And I don't know. I like your idea though. Could be transport. It could be right. You're going for could physically be. going, could be. But I like your TV screen idea. Yeah. Well, I mean, because it's it's you can't actually go through the door, right? I mean, it's a, it's stone, but it's but it's it's highlighting this gate. You know, right? I should say gate, not door, but it's it's highlighting these gates that um, it's implied. Well, how many sites? Well, through. okay. How many sites around the world have nearly the exact same thing? Yeah. A, a lot. A lot of cultures had those same doorways with the stuff, you know, you're not walking through it, but it's got a door frame carved in the stone. Yeah. And then that's in the middle. It's it's like every culture had had, had some version of this. Yeah. And, you know, the standard Egyptologists will say, oh, well, that's just like a, that's a that's a fake door that uh, that the soul is able to go through uh, in the afterlife after the person dies, and it's meant to be the the uh, the uh, gate that shows the pharaoh where to go after he's dead. And it's like, okay, but uh, this isn't a funerary temple that you're finding it in. You know, this is this is a temple of instruction. So that doesn't really uh, hold water as far as that explanation goes. So it, it, it definitely seems to be there for educational, instructional purposes. Uh, and it, it, it's implied that those instructions are coming from uh, other beings from the stars to the Pharaoh itself, which hence why it was called a stargate to begin with.
Um, Elephantine Island. Oh, yeah. my One of my favorite places. Holy <laughs> crap, right? Yeah, for Holy sure. Holy crap. So did you meet Showski, uh, the, the mm -hmm. director of Aswan? Okay, all right. Yeah. So um, I'm sitting with him. <laughs> Great guy, by the way. I mean, um, uh, I don't want to get anybody into any trouble. So I, and I'm not going to do that to him or, or anybody. So I'm not going to name names. But you and I have had the privilege of meeting the directors of each one of these sites. Mm -hmm. Okay. It doesn't matter where, where we're going, whether it's Karnak, Luxor, Edfu, Abydos, right? Uh, Aswan. It, it, it doesn't matter. We're, we're talking to the, the bosses there and, and think. I'm going to, can I go on the record? Can I go on the record and say this without getting anybody in trouble? These guys aren't Zahi Haiwas. Mm -mm. No. These guys, these guys have very open minds. Yeah. And as they are doing the archaeology at these sites, and they've been there for decades, um, they're seeing through the BS. Yeah. For do, sure. Do you understand what I'm saying? Am, am I oh, yeah. I don't want to get anybody into any trouble here. Okay. But I think they're on our side of the fence. They're 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 digging up too much stuff, yeah. and they're I think they're they're confused. Uh, their education is clashing with reality. Am I wrong here? No, you're right. Well, and not only that, but I think they they understand that some of the things that they're finding, especially at like Elephantine Island, uh, completely goes against the standard narrative of Egyptology that's being taught out there. I mean, for example, at Elephantine Island, there are murals. There's a, there's a, there's a temple of Tutmosis the third there, and there are murals of it, of Egyptians meeting with Mayans trading beads. Well, how are you going to explain this according to our modern, uh, our, our modern historical narrative? I mean, it, it, it falls outside of it. So, so what they do is they just keep it closed to the public. They say, we don't want to have to explain it. They keep it closed to the public, but it's there. And there are other things there too, like, uh, like the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> like the Ark, there's an Ark that's supposed to be there. I mean, and it's, it's uh, they've been digging for it for the last 60 years, and it's it's clearly emitting uh, a tremendous amount of energy because the granite in the area is starting to turn to slate, which is really unusual. And then, um, you know, they've they've also found things there like uh, uh, boomerangs, which uh, are. <laughs> The, the 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 Egyptian texts refer to them as magic throwing sticks, but these but the, of course they're magic throwing sticks. They're they're boomerangs. You can throw them and they come back to you. How magical is that? But this is something that clearly came probably from Australia, and uh, and some of these these boomerangs even have a set on them. Uh, the god Set and Set looks like a kangaroo on them. So again, it suggests that the Egyptians, or at least somebody prior to the Egyptians who, and the Egyptians preserved the information and tried to preserve the memory of it, um, was traveling uh, across the entire earth at some point in time and, and was encountering cultures in the uh, the Americas and uh, as well as cultures in Australia, and again that goes completely against the narrative. But there it is on Elephantine Island. Elephantine Island, um, I I I want to explore more there. There's so much to see. Um, it it some of it again. Well, I it's it's, it's a term that's overused uh, when it comes to Egypt, but it's it's beyond explanation. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make right. any sense. And yeah. Elephantine Island, which sits right in the middle of the Nile, uh, you take a quick boat ride, you know, out from Aswan, and you arrive there. It's what, five? Eight, no, I was going to say 10 minutes, probably a little Maybe longer, but it's in minutes. there. Yeah. Yeah, 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 right right in the middle of the Nile. 
um, gorgeous temple, temples, uh, plural, uh, tombs, and 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 whatnot. But uh, at the top of the island, they call it the portico. All right, but mm-hmm. man. If that ain't a Stargate, I don't know what is. Yeah. And so I separated from the group and and walked over to it and I shot video and 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 took some pictures, but I walked through it and stood on the other side and just observed. You can see the entire Nile and the old town below and um uh it's about as dramatic as it gets, but you just step back and you look at this like what's the reason? Why 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 is this here? Yeah. On this on this cliff, right? <laughs> it's just like mm-hmm. this bizarre, thing. and it, it it's a stargate anyway. So the Ark of the Covenant was brought there, and it never left. Now we've got all kinds of stories. Now you have told us, you've told me on my TV show and on this show, yeah, that uh, th- th- that you are aware of ten arcs. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, so is this the Ark? I don't know. Uh, we know about uh, Ethiopia and some other locations around the world where um, Arks were brought to. Well, one was brought to this island and was stashed there for for thousands of years. Yeah, and and, and it, there was a Jewish temple that was even built there at one point. There's a Jewish well. temple. There's a Jewish yeah. temple, yes. Um, and so uh, I'm talking to the director. Right. I said, okay, man. What's up? Can can you and I take a walk? Just just by ourselves. You know, <laughs> he laughs. I don't know where it is. And I go, oh, come on, man. The <laughs> island's not that big. And uh he said, No, but they are looking for it. Um yeah. uh, what what what's your what's your guess? Do you think uh one of the arcs is uh still on that island? I definitely think so, and I think that uh People have been looking for it for a while. I know um, my order, the Templar order, had a even had a preceptory on the island at one point in time, and there's still a there's still a marker there on the island with a big Templar cross on it uh, from mm-hmm. from there. So, but th- that's what they were looking for, um, you know, uh, eight eight hundred years ago. So it's 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 had a long history of. Uh, people looking for it there, but it the 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 temple, the walls seem to suggest it. And there's something else about that island that we should point out as well, and that is that it appears like some sort of major disaster happened on that island. Okay, there I'm are just going to talk about that. Yeah, yes. hundred ton uh, boxes that have been just thrown over just just and, cast just cast about like they were right. nothing yeah and there uh, was there, there's even like uh giant structures that just blew apart you know it's like a bomb went off there and a lot of power was on that island and yeah. um the germans were excavating on that island uh mm-hmm. for a long time they were looking for the ark um yeah, and right. and you could you could see it it's everywhere the island itself, every piece of the island uh, uh, at some point was a temple or some kind of structure. There's stairs, stone stairs, up and down on all sides. Uh, mm-hmm. It's it's an incredible, incredible place to go and visit. But then uh, you get to the top of the island, what Tim is referring to. You, you go across this walkway. And as you're heading up, uh, okay, if you're heading up, it's to your left. If you're coming back down, it'll be to your right. Is this, again, it's like a Saurian big. Mm -hmm. It's, dude, you know what what that looks like to me? Hmm. Can I, can I, I, I'm just going to say it. I'm going to say it out loud. That looks like a Stargate gone wrong. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, okay. Like you you thought, yeah, yourself. yeah, yeah. That's because the the box itself. We're calling it a box. Um, there's a doorway. You can see the hinges, right? There's hinges on both sides. Um, it's probably twenty feet by fifteen feet rectangle. Perfectly cut entrance. 
perfect. It's got a seat on the inside of it on the bottom. You can see it. It's exactly what it is. And yeah. it is huge. It's 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 bigger than my studio. And my studio's 20 by 30 feet. All yeah. right. In here. And it, it's that big. And you can see the hinges. Uh, you can see the doorway. It's on its side, everybody. And then on the top is cut like a pyramid. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it has that same. It's almost the same type of looking box that 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 image that uh, you showed of Edfu of the the ark. It's the same Edfu. thing. Same type yeah, of yeah. box. Yeah. Same same um, thing. Uh, just bigger. Yeah. So yeah, there was some there was something going on there at, at that island, and it it went wrong clearly because it looks like it completely uh, blew apart. Uh, but you know we have found the reven remnants of um, uh, travels clearly to other other territories. I mean, there's temples depicting again Egyptians meeting with Mayans and trading be beads. Uh, there's the boomerangs found there. There's also, and my girlfriend pointed this out that, that uh, she's a herbalist, and and some of the um, plants on the island are uh, Native American cactuses that don't grow in in uh, that they're not native to Egypt, but they're growing there on the island. You don't see it see them growing in anywhere else in Egypt, but they're there on Elephantine Island, which again suggests that somebody at some point in time brought them there to that island. And the fact that there's also the, um, the Mayan depictions on the, on the temple walls mm, seems to suggest maybe it had to do with some sort of trade in antiquity. And, and, uh, but it's, it's still, <laughs> then you got the Stargate looking thing there too. It's it's hard to know what is really going on there. That that is a special place, man. Yeah. That is it was just uh, very spiritual too as well. It's a very powerful place, but something there was um, the amount of I don't know how many. It was talk about manpower, not horsepower, manpower. How yeah. many men it would take to tip over a box like that and then to break it apart? How, how many? Yeah. How many thousands? Yeah, it's I mean, not it's it's not you and a couple of buddies, you know, no. cow tipping. That's no, that's, no, that's, no it's that's, huge, it's tremendous weight. I mean, uh, any somewhere between sixty and a hundred tons. I mean, it is gigantic and super heavy. So. Um, uh, the, um, the other part, uh, that I wanted to mention, did you get a chance to go to KV nine? Was it open when you were there oh, in the Valley of the Kings? Yeah. KV nine. Yeah. Uh, oh. on a previous oh. trip I did not this. Okay. Scotland, it's same, yeah. same thing there. So down, uh, everybody down at the bottom of KV nine, not one. Two sarcophagus uh, mm -hmm. side by side down on the bottom uh, that were blown up, blown mm -hmm. up. And, and and so they've got one kind of pieced back together. It's literally in a thousand pieces of black granite. Yeah. And, and, and the two uh, granite boxes, which are the same size as what you see in the uh, Serapium, right? Serapium. Yep. Huge. Broken and flipped over and you're looking at, you know, a 50 or a hundred ton, a block of granite. I, I have no idea the tonnage or the weight, but they are huge. It's the size of a locomotive broken yeah. apart and flipped over in the bottom. Yeah. So what I, the, the, the room itself at the bottom of KV nine, it's pretty good size, but you're not going to get that many guys in there, men, to flip right. it over and and to well, break and, it apart, well, and, and to get it down there to begin with, you know, it's a whole nother like what. <laughs> uh, it, and I think this is a good point to point out too. Uh, any, when you're talking about the Valley of the Kings, you know the the standard 
the standard explanation is that the pharaohs found this secret place, this area, and they started digging into the mountainside, and then they just made their tombs there, and uh, they they wanted to keep it secret to keep it from um, prying from eyes being, from being and, robbed and robbers. Yeah, being right. being robbed. But the reality is those all of those tombs are connected by these tunnels. There's an entire tunnel system going all throughout the Valley of the Kings. And it seems more likely uh, it would have taken, it would have taken thousands and thousands of workers to dig out all those tunnels. And of course, if you're hiring thousands and thousands of workers to dig out all these tunnels, the odds of you keeping that place secret are, are, are about impossible at that point. So uh, the question then is why were they digging these tunnels? And then why did they uh, put the tombs in there? And privately what Egyptologists have discussed uh, and that can, this doesn't, this isn't the public discussion, but privately what they've discussed is that these tunnels may have actually been uh, survival bunkers at one point in time uh, from the last cataclysm. And that uh, what the pharaohs did is later on, they had a memory of this spot that had been dug out thousands of years prior to them. And so they thought, well, uh, they wanted to be buried close to uh, the, the source of these people that were able to do things that the pharaohs aren't even able to do anymore. So they started putting their tombs in this area that the pharaohs had passed on the memory of, but by that point, the general public had completely forgotten about and didn't know about. So, but it puts a very different, uh, a very different perspective on what the Valley of the Kings is. Uh, and, and it implies that yeah, originally it was probably correct. Uh, created all those tunnels were created as a as a survivor survival bunker area uh, from the last cataclysm. And yeah, then it was I have, repurposed later. I yeah. have uh, I have just one shot. I'm going to pop this up so everybody can kind of understand what what uh, Tim and I are are talking about, and then we will call it a night. I'm just going to share this really quick so everybody can kind of cop a vibe. I don't, I've got many shots, but I don't have the shots of the, the boxes of themselves, but I'm going to, I'm going to show everybody this. This is, uh, there's pieces here. All right. So this is the bottom of KV nine. This is one of, uh, the inside sarcophagus. The other one is off to the right, but look at this. This is, you know, two feet thick, all right, just to give you an idea. And look how this thing is broken apart. And look at the size of it. I don't know what kind of explosion or what was going on, but you're not doing that with a sledgehammer. Mm -mm. You're, no. you're just simply not. And that's at the bottom in, in this chamber. Now, in front here... There, this is this is a, a piece, a piece of the big stone granite uh, sarcophagus, the box that this was inside of. Here's another piece of uh, it here. And then in front of this entire section, this whole width of this room is full of chunks. <laughs> I mean, they're just chunks the size of F-150 pickup trucks. Yeah. Am I wrong here, Tim? No, it's that's just an accurate description. <laughs> huge. Just, just, just huge. And you're looking at this and you're just thinking, what kind of violence happened in this room? And the room itself is not damaged. The right. painting is still perfect. The walls are perfect. The columns are perfect. But right in the middle of the floor are is are these two giant boxes. Of you know that are the walls of the boxes are two feet thick, right? And and just broken apart. And then off to the right is another identical 
uh, sarcophagus to this one that they've also glued back together. And by the way, um, piece back together, the sarco- this is the lid to the sarcophagus. The other one is whole. Well, it's pieced back together like puzzle pieces. That sarcophagus that sat inside of this box is probably six feet tall. This, mm-hmm. And that's the lid to it. And mm-hmm. just broken into like almost granite dust, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's a thousand pieces. It's crazy. What, I, I don't know what happened. It's some kind of very, very, it looks like an explosion to me. It's like, it's like something from the mummy movie where the mummy like busted out of it or something. <laughs> Tim, I can't wait to to hang out with you in three short weeks at uh, Stairway to the Stars, and uh, I can't wait to introduce you and 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 sit through your uh, presentation. I'm very excited about this. Uh, safe travels uh, to Las Vegas. I'll see you in three short weeks. Uh, where can everybody go and follow you and your work? Great. I said, where can everybody go? Well, and you follow can find me on uh, Facebook. Certainly, I have a Facebook. Well, uh, well, they can they can follow my work. Uh, you can you can find me on YouTube. Uh, you can also find me on uh, Instagram, Facebook, you know, other social media outlets, uh, as well as uh, Lulu dot com has a number of my books. So there's Just Google go. Timothy Lulu, Hogan. You'll find me. <laughs> Lulu's links are below and we have them there and throughout social media. Timothy Hogan. And you're a walking encyclopedia. I appreciate everything that you do, my friend. And I'll see you in three weeks at Stairway to the Stars. Three weeks, you and I are hanging out and we'll break bread. Dinner's on me. Thank you, brother. Sounds great. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Jimmy. The absolute best. Timothy Hogan. And with that, I'm going to get out of here tomorrow night right here on Fade to Black. Daryl Anka is joining us tomorrow night. It's going to be one of those shows. So I'll see everybody tomorrow night. And then I want to remind you that Wednesday night, Richard Dolan right here on Fade to Black. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee Newman, and Michelle Freed. Thank you to Dennis and Kevin. Thank you, Jonicide, Zenzabil. Thank you, guys. You're the best. It's good to see you again. It's good to be back. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and copyrighted. 2023 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, or copied anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with Daryl Anka, I want you to be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.